نحمده و نسلی علی رسول الكریم اما بعد السلام علیکم و رحمت الله و برکاته and welcome again to another episode of سیرت خاتم النبیین the biography of Prophet Muhammad صلی الله علیه و سلم in the last episode uh, we discussed in quite detail the tribe of Quraysh the tribe from which Prophet Muhammad صلی الله علیه و سلم was was from its uh, source and Nadir ibn Kinana or his uh, great grandson Quraysh himself. We had the various topics that we discussed. Where did the word come from? What does it derive? I hope you uh, enjoy that one and we will carry on now. Because we did leave you last uh, episode discussing this particular point of the importance of the Kaaba and how it was perceived by people within Arabia, irrespective of religion or political uh, affiliation. And it's this particular Kaaba itself which we're going to now give some uh, attention to because we're going to talk about how it's passed hands away from the Khuzaa tribe, which I hope you can remember and I won't repeat here again. Um, I hope you can get access to the earlier episodes and you can maybe watch it again just to re-familiarize yourself with how Khuzaa took hold. But it was Quraysh now that's going to start to have sway and control things. It mentions, uh, the historians mention that Qusay's mother uh, was married to Rabia ibn Haram of Udra and he took her and her son to his own country. Later, when the young man grew up, Qusay came back to Makkah and he married a young girl called Huba and she was the daughter of the chief of the Khuza. So we're seeing now how the chieftain's daughters married this, this, this man uh, early in, in one of the early stages. And it says here that Khuza'a, they said that Hulayl had entrusted the guardianship of the house, the Kaaba, to Qusay because of the large family Qusay had had with his daughter. You didn't realize that this family, remember, level one family, is going to be quite a large family. Clearly, it's going to, in those days, the family size determined power. So as a result, they're the best people to be, to be entrusted. Out of all my children, I will entrust them. With, uh, with, with this family. So he was obviously giving it to his daughter, by, which meant by giving it to his son-in-law as well. And this is how then uh, Qusay uh, ibn Kilab, uh, who was a Qureshi, took some authority over there. And when he handed it to him, Hulayl also told him, you have more right to it than I do. And this is the account which we've heard from, or has been the historians Ibn Ishaq mentions that was heard from Huza. And uh, this is how they, they, they took hold of the, uh, uh, of the access to the Kaaba. And this was uh, uh, quite an important step uh, because this, uh, this, this authority that this would bring about, as I will describe to you, you will see, uh, it brought about a great level of strength and a great level of uh, power to the tribe of Quraysh over the rest of the people. So it's discussed amongst the historians that when these individuals, when uh, Qusay took this, uh, this honor, uh, he, was, uh, uh, he obviously had uh, the opportunity now to carry some sway in political circles as well. Because having this, as I said to you, and I, I know I've probably repeated this many a times now, is the Kaaba held a great, uh, was held in high esteem amongst the mushrikeen, the polytheists who had come before, who were living before Islam. So they went, with this in mind, what we saw was Qusay was the first of the Banu Ka'ab who took this uh, uh, a new role of his uh, kingship as well. So he developed it because in those days there was very little uh, kings uh, amongst the Arabs. Arabs were really run along tribal lines and they had a tribal leader and it was the tribal leader uh, who would control the tribes and then they would have sort of confederations of tribes. Uh, sort of the, the sort of macro coming together of various tribes, sort of intertribal ties and relationships in order to have more power and authority, because it was always about power and authority. But Qusay, once he had taken guardianship of uh, the, uh, the Kaaba, he realized that this was an opportunity uh, which had been missed by many before, which was that as long as I had the authority and guardianship over the Kaaba, then in essence I had keys to Mecca, because this, the Kaaba controlled everything. And whoever had control of the Kaaba, by extension, could control Makkah and those who resided in it. So he brought uh, uh, his people from their various dwellings and their various areas and he said, look, could move back into Makkah, reside in Makkah 
I'm already there, I have control, I have authority, and start living in Mecca. And, uh, and I will act as your leader, which seems to make sense because at the end of the day, I'm already in charge. And as he did that, kind of automatically, the Meccans also uh, accepted him as their leader. And he became not just a leader, though, he became a king. He became seen as uh, separate from his people. And this is the status he'd reached. So Qusay was the first of, as I mentioned, Banu Kaab, who, beca who became the king. And he was obeyed by his people as such. And with this, he had the uh, rights of hijaba, he had the rights of saqaya, he had the rights of rifada, uh, and he had the nadwa and the liwa. And what this means here is, in respectively, is he had the guardianship, uh, the hijaba over the house, he had the provision, the siqaya, he had the provision of water for the pilgrims. Uh, he also had the provision of food for them. Uh, he resided over the assemblies, the meetings that took place. And he was the one that would issue any banners that would be carried by the various tribes. So you can see that he really took uh, this, uh, this role and he took it to the next level. People up until that time had restricted themselves just to having the authority over the Kaaba and having some limited authority elsewhere. But they just saw it as a duty, as a responsibility. Uh, here we can see that Qusay didn't necessarily see it as a responsibility, as a duty. He saw an opportunity, as we've seen so far with the Quraysh. The Quraysh were a people who saw opportunities and they seized those opportunities and they gobbled up, as the word Quraysh comes from, from whatever was around and used that opportunity and took advantage of that situation. So when he had that, well, he, was, he wasn't going to necessarily keep all those various, because it was an honor as well to, to be providing water for the pilgrims. It was an honor uh, to sit in charge of assemblies of the people of Mecca and decide on matters. It was, a, it was a, an honor to be producing the banners for the various tribes for war. These were not sort of, and looking after the Kaaba, well, that, that requires no explanation in terms of the honor there. So what he did was he sort of, uh, the, uh, the honors that he did, he decided to divide them uh, up. Um, uh, so, so he decided to divide up Mecca. So he had a different kind of mindset now in terms of how he was going to govern Mecca. Nobody had really taken that responsibility. Things just happened. Uh, there was no one sort of planning. There was nobody in charge. There was nobody deciding on a holistic level as to what's going to happen in Mecca. So what he did was he divided up Mecca amongst his people into various quarters and he settled each family of the Quraysh into their dwelling. So in each quarter was his family. And he knew that they would always support him and they would always trust him. And therefore, he, in any uprising or any uh, anybody challenging his authority could easily be put to, put to rest. And it's in a way, uh, uh, you know, it might look like from, from the outset that he's sort of taking advantage of this situation and he's uh, uh, arguably benefiting from it personally and he's, he's, his family members are benefit, benefit from, benefiting from it. But it wasn't just uh, him that was benefiting because when you start to get some kind of uh, authority in place, the quick thing, the thing which comes quite quickly is uh, law and order. Uh, because there's somebody who's in charge, there's somebody who we are accountable to. And due to this accountability, due to this uh, uh, justice, that, uh, this, this law and order, what we began to see, or what was noticed in Mecca, is that justice started to return. Um, the Quraysh settled in their dwellings and, and we saw that the uh, Khuza'a had realized what had happened. They realized that they had just absolutely lost all the uh, uh, the power that they had originally as a tribe. They saw how the Quraysh, in this case Qusay uh, ibn Kilab, had taken it from just being a, a responsibility, a duty, kind of low profile, but still quite a, an honor. An honor. But he had taken it to, uh, to, to something else. And uh, uh, they, they, you know, there was no chance really now because of what Qusay ibn Kilab was offering for the people that the people would ever want to change and go back to the old ways. So that was basically the uh, nail in the coffin for Khuza'a to be able to ever step up to that again. Um, but what they did do was obviously what the, 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 in terms of the religious worship, in terms of the idol worship that was going on, they did not change that. So the Quraysh continued those practices, those practices which had been brought about by the tribe of Khuzar. So we saw, for instance, the worshipping of idols still carrying on, the way they were set up around the Kaaba, people allowing uh, people being permitted to sacrifice to them, pray near them, and even begging, begging them for, for, for items and for things. 
So we see these uh, various uh, people being settled, but not only were they settled in uh, the sort of inner area of Makkah, they were also settled in the uh, sort of outer areas in the higher lands of Makkah as well. So eventually they became called the plains of Quraysh or the highlands of Quraysh. And with this, uh, Qusay ibn Kila was building more and more authority and he was becoming more and more powerful because being the guardian and the keeper of the Kaaba and the one who gives out the banners, he not only uh, for, for war, he not only was controlling the um, affairs within the city, sort of like home affairs, he was also dealing with foreign policy and foreign affairs as well. So in essence, he had become a king. But he wasn't, as we've already seen, he wasn't just a king that was out for power. He was also a very s a smart man, a very intelligent man. And what he wanted to do was establish some kind of peace. He wanted to establish some order. So he, what he did was he constructed a building. And this building that he constructed was to prevent violence between tribes and resolve disputes amicably. And he called this the Darul Nadwa. And this Dal Nadwa was a place where people could go, where they had their disputes and be heard and listened to, and then obviously resolve them verbally, even though things may get hot sometimes, without having to uh, resort to bloodshed and violence. And this word Dal Nadwa means the assembly house, you know, it means the, the house where people gather. And this is, as I mentioned to you, they would come and discuss things. But once it became an, uh, an opportunity for people to discuss things, it also carried out other responsibilities. So marriage contracts uh, were carried out there first. Any other large business contracts were conducted there first. And uh, so you're starting to see that this uh, became a sort of a social institute with, which had uh, the backing of the authority as well, in which the people could see the benefits. Of, of, of its existence and also see the benefits that Qusay ibn Kilab, by extension the tribe of Quraysh, had brought to Makkah. The door of this building was facing Masjid al-Haram and uh, later uh, it this door was owned by Hakim ibn Hizam after belonging to Abbanu Abdul Dar and he sold it during the time of uh, Muawiyah this particular door and uh, uh, he was criticized for that. Uh, for saying that you know you've basically sold your honor and with this uh, providing of water and providing of drink we can see that the people would prefer to drink from those uh, pots and, and 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 pots and vessels which uh, which were his permanent personally and they would uh, they would like to utilize that and the pilgrims would come for that in this time obviously the, the in this time that we're referring to the the zamzam well had been obliterated uh, and it returned to back as to the way it was before the Jurham tribe had arrived uh, and people had forgotten about it as to where it was and where it was located and it's saying that Qusay was the first person then to institute lighting a fire at as Muzdalifa to guide people coming there from Arafat so he's starting to see that he had much use as well beyond his own personal gains so his leadership brought greatness to the people around them. And there's a statement that Ibn Ishaq mentions that Qusay had imposed on his people, uh, the Rifada, Rifada which I've already mentioned means providing food for the pilgrims during the pilgrimage. And he's reported to have said the following, he said, Oh people of Quraysh, you are Allah subhanahu wa neighbors and the inhabitants of Makkah and of all the holy places. The pilgrims are Allah's guests and visitors to his house. They have full right to your hospitality. So provide food and drink for them during the, these days until they depart from you. And so they did. Each year people would set aside a portion of their wealth as a tribute. They would pay him and he would use it to provide food for the people uh, during the days they were at Mina. And the practice was followed at his commands even during the times of Jahiliya. And it was passed on up to the present. And in fact, it is the time the Sultan would provide for people at Mina each year until the pilgrimage ends. We even see to this day the custodian of the two uh, holy mosques, as you'll see, wherever you go whilst you're traveling in Saudi Arabia during the days, during the time of Hajj, and even in the time of Umrah, you will see every now and then your bus, depending on where it's going, will pull up. Uh, a few chaps will get inside and they'll give you little treat boxes, and when you look inside, you're box the tree you'll have biscuits in there maybe a carton of milk some juice something else all piled in and they give that free you ask for more they'll give you more 
and you'll see that then you go somewhere else when you're at Mina they'll have little parcels there for you as well when you're at Musdalifa they'll have little parcels there for you as well they'll give you gifts in Mina and this is carried on up until today it's been carrying on and he was the uh, it's uh, al Qusay who had started this rifada he had started this uh, st uh, st uh, task rather act of giving food to the pilgrims and it has continued to this day in now what 2017 and uh, long may it continue i mean it's a it's a provision uh, we do when we go across to saudi arabia you know we mourn a lot we complain a lot but you know trying to uh, meet the needs of around two and in some cases up to four million people over a you know period of five ten days is a, a, a monstrosity of a, a responsibility and an act it's near impossible when you sit down and try to look at the logistics and uh, how that will can come about how is it that you move such a large number of people from the airports over such a small period of time and then house them in hotels and you know with small roads uh, where traffic is you know virtually at a standstill sometimes and then this huge group of people you know large talking millions here are moving from Mecca to go to certain places you know uh, Muzdalifa, uh, Araf Mina, Muzdalifa, Arafat and then returning back to Mecca and then obviously going for the Jamarat and going all to Medina it's an, you know it's an incredible incredible uh, organization required and yet you know bus comes an hour late and we're complaining crying out loud you know here in the streets of Bradford the bus can come an hour late and it's only picking up three or four passengers so can you imagine uh, the scale that we're talking about and you know food comes you know you hear you, you just order a takeaway it can come half an hour 45 minutes late there you've got you know uh, thousands if not literally millions of people trying to get food and all from the same areas of course it's going to be hectic of course it's going to be busy no matter where you go you've got to be prepared for waiting for queuing and you'd be surprised that as a community as a, as a as a country britain known for its queuing supposedly it's a it's a it's a british value uh, we you know we should be used to it but arguably you know we lose our temper more than most so it's a it's something to look at so we see for instance then you know uh, and as obviously this was later on uh, uh, you know it now we you know we see now the government the government of Saudi Arabia providing for this, which is the same as uh, you know what was in the past when Islam was uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, and that was the Bayt al Mal, which was the general treasury, and this was spent to get food and drink uh, for wayfarers arriving for the pilgrimage, and uh, it's a, it's a reward. Obviously, it was done for the sake of reward, and it was done in order to make sure that this person will be looked after why why is this person being looked after you know he's already got plenty of money the reason why he's being looked after because he is the guest of Allah he is coming to the house of Allah meaning obviously the word house of Allah when it's referring to it like in that way it means the honor which Allah subhanahu has given it the honor is given it that he's associated his name with it this is the honor that he's given this and what he's saying is that this these people are coming uh, to worship me these people are coming to the ancient house they're coming here to remember the ritual rites that their forefathers starting from Ibrahim والسلام, and that's what they're coming for and they're coming to carry out certain ritual acts which they can't carry out anywhere else which can only be carried out in this holy land so I want them to be looked after I want my guests to be well fed to be nourished to be given water to drink now obviously we've got money when we arrive there we don't arrive without money we've got access to credit cards even now on our phones we can just beep them across screens and and pay for food uh, though this was a time where people were traveling from far far away water obviously could only be carried on your back or on your animal so you could only carry a certain amount of water food as well there could only be a certain amount of food and clearly food will go off so you could only carry a certain amount of food or buy it along the way and again you could only carry a certain amount of money and it would already cost you quite a lot of money a to take time out from your work and with us we can take you know 10 days off holiday or 15 days off work uh, which is paid as well so we're not so this was a time but it's continued we see it now and we see it being continued uh, up to this point where people the, the pilgrims who arrive in Mecca the pilgrims who arrive in Medina are being looked after and this is a, a, an act which he which he started so as Kosei who's brought these in, Kosei ibn Kilab who's brought this, uh, uh, these new acts in, as he grew older and older, he, he entrusted these uh, responsibilities that he had, uh, that he'd enjoyed uh, uh, to others. So basically what was that? 
uh, the, the leadership of Quraysh that he had because he was a king now of Mecca, never mind of, amongst the Quraysh. The honor of governing these, the, the provision of food and water, like we've already mentioned, looking after the house, uh, issuing the banners uh, and bringing summoning assemblies, you know, calling the chief leaders in when he, as he chose. And he passed this son, uh, passed this on rather to his son Abd Adar, and who was his eldest son. So you see here that Qusay ibn Kilab were instrumental in organizing a new role, a new, a new power base, a new individual that never existed in the history of the Arabs, which, which he had brought about, and he had brought it about whilst he was a tribe of Quraysh. Now there's a reason for that. This is not coincidental. This is not just happened by chance that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was also from the tribe of Quraysh. And this is why the Quraysh in particular are highly regarded as people uh, who should be leaders. In fact, it's mentioned that the Khulafa should always be from the Quraysh because they're natural born leaders. Leadership is something which is passed on uh, through, through genealogy. Through the through from one father to, a, to from one man to another man, and this is something these skills and these naturally gifted talents that this person will possess, which, as we know, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu would need when he would arrive, because he also became a leader, a leader that never ever and has never since arrived on in the Arabian Peninsula, a man who brought tribes together that no one had brought together before, a man who had turned a group of people who were too busy killing each other into a single unit becoming so powerful that it destroyed all the superpowers of the day this was not by chance either so this is he was picked from a very pure highly regarded intelligent organized group of people so when Qusay ibn Kilab became old, he handed over his responsibilities, he kept it within the Quraysh, and he handed those responsibilities over to his son Abdul Dar, and he was the eldest. And he looked after, he looked after these um, because um, the, others, uh, the, the other sons that he had, he had Abd Manaf and Abd Shamsan, uh, he had left them be. And Qusay obviously wanted the, to reach them in equality because his other sons had done quite well. Abd Manaf, Abd Shams, and Abd, they had already got some prestige and power within the community. So they were already highly regarded. So as a result, he wanted a little bit of respect for his, his eldest son, which was Abd Dar, and he gave him this to look after. And Abd Dar's brothers did not dispute with him. Uh, the action that, that, that had taken place. Um, you know, they had no issue with it. They couldn't understand why their father had chosen Abdul Dar to hand this over to him because they understood that they were already fairly powerful men and this would give them quite a high level of power, yet their other brother had, had no authority whatsoever. But when they had all passed away, then their sons, obviously, as in the grandsons of Qusay ibn Kilab, had issues, and they would obviously then conflict was brought about. So you always see that the people who establish things rarely have conflict, but when they pass away, and those who come after, and they're going to now inherit what's been left, you then start to see uh, individuals fighting over what was left. So, you know, and this is the point there is. They say, of course, they only entrusted Abdul Dar with, uh, with that to equalize with his brothers, and therefore we are entitled to what our fathers were due, and our fathers will never receive that. Now, we've got some more to share with you in terms of uh, what happened with uh, Abdul Dar and what happened with his, and, and when he took over, and how did this develop, and, and where does uh, uh, Abdul Muttalib fit into this? And where does Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu fit into all of this? Uh, but as is the case when I reach this point, and you can tell by the way I'm winding things up, is that we've now reached the end of uh, this episode as well. And uh, we've left you at a point where we had introduced a new, a new individual, a new role, a new title. We've seen now Darul Nadwa. We've seen now the banners having uh, been produced by the Quraysh. The Quraysh is set up as an elite group of people led by a single individual, the person in charge of the family of Quraysh. It is getting, it's going to be, it's becoming highly regarded. It's becoming very powerful. It's been able to exercise that power. And the one who brought that together was was always undisputed. He was always unchallenged, as because he, he is the one who is initiating it. But as he's passed on and he's passed on to his son then the brothers of this Abdul Dar were quite acceptable of what had happened because they couldn't understand the reasoning but when it got to the grandsons of Qusay ibn Malik then this was a sorry Qusay ibn Kilab then this became slightly problematic until we started to see some disputes happening and how 
Well, we need to find out, does Abdullah survive these, uh, these challenges? Does he resolve his disputes? Does he do it amicably? Does he kill them? Well, that and for other questions and for us to carry on with our journey, you'll have to join me again in the next episode of Siratul Khatib al Nabiyyin, in which we, I, can, you know, I can feel it now, I can taste it now. We're drawing closer and closer to the arrival of Prophet Muhammad wasalam, and hopefully you can continue with me on this journey. I hope to see you soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.